Good afternoon, everyone. We hope you're doing well wherever you are. My name is David Gellis. I'm a business reporter here at the New York Times and the corner office columnist. For the past few months, we've been holding these calls and talking to business leaders about their response to the pandemic, the protests, and more. Today, we're glad to welcome Maverick Carter. Mav is a director at Live Nation and the co-founder and CEO of Springhill Company, which he founded with his longtime business partner, LeBron James. A quick housekeeping note. You may submit questions at any time during this event using the Q&A feature in Zoom. We'll get to them in a little bit. Please also note that this event is being recorded, and this is an audio-only event. Maz, thank you so much for being here. David, thank you. I appreciate you having me. So let's start, and I know there's a lot going on, but let's start by discussing the protests against racism and police brutality that are still ongoing weeks after the killing of George Floyd. You've been engaged in these issues personally and professionally for years now. And many people say that this time feels different, that there's a real window for change right now. And so I want to ask, does it feel different to you? What will you need to see to convince you that real change is afoot? Yeah, I think the protests, um, rightfully so, have been, um, have lasted a long time. But, you know, as black people, we've been ringing this alarm for a long time in this country. And the fabric, uh, it's built into the fabric of this country of, you know, oppressing black people through socially, politically, and economically. And they all kind of go hand in hand. And I say, as I've been telling people, yeah, I've been in the middle of the fight my whole life for 38 years. And um, this has now risen to the top of everyone's mind. So it's very topical at the moment. It's gotten everyone's attention. Everyone I talk to, uh, business, political, social, just everyone is talking about these issues. What can they do? I think in order to achieve real change, um, we as the black community need to come up with real ask, and we have to determine what do we actually want. We obviously want some social uh, reform, through police brutality and, and, and things like that. We also need political changes. We all we need, you know, LeBron and I started More Than a Vote, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we call it More Than a Vote because, A, it definitely is to help fight voter suppression and to get people out and vote, but we it's about more than voting. We have to – what are we as black people asking of these politicians? What do we want them to change in legislature? And I'm not – I don't have the answer yet, but we need to get to a very specific ask. The groups who get things done and things change, like the unions and another thing, they have very specific ask. If you want their vote, they want this done, and we need to get to that point. And then on the economic side, because as I said, social, political, and economic, they all go together, and we need change in all of them. We need corporate America. You know, you wrote an article that was really uh, – well laid out how corporate America as a part of the economic system and the, and the commercial side and the capitalist system has failed black people. We need to really um, get change that allows corporate America to create pathways for black people to reach the top of these companies because what happens is in these companies you end up with biases that are not exactly races, but they get the same outcome. Bias and races mm-hmm. and races get the same outcome. So you have people who are not racist, but they perpetuate and benefit from a system that oppresses black people because, you know, bias becomes I hang out with, I talk to, I mentor the people who went to the same schools as me, you know, go to the same bar I go to, drink the same yeah. beer. And then if you're a higher up, well, then those become the people you take a liking to and you help get a pathway to the top of the company. Right, right. Yeah, someone during the reporting of that made the distinction between diversity and inclusion. And they said it's not enough to have a few uh, people who diversify the environment. It's about making it an inclusive environment where everyone participates in the wealth creation, where everyone participates in the mentorship that's available. So let's let's break that down a bit. You talked about the 
economic, the social, and the political. Let's talk economic because you brought up this article, and I'm, of course, a business reporter. So what kind of specific things are you looking for on the corporate front? You talked about knowing what your asks are. Now, in my article last week, uh, other black executives called for specific things like more internships, better diversity metrics. Is that sufficient in your mind, or what are the specific things you believe are necessary to achieve greater parity in the workplace? Yeah, I think, you know, at our company, we've just done it because it's just who we are. Mm. Um, and and our upper management and throughout the whole company is extremely diverse men, women, black, white, um, Hispanics, all type of people work in our company. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 great for business, but it's also just good socially. But also, you know, I think... A big part of it is, as you said, I'm a director at Live Nation, and I've been fortunate enough to uh, develop a friendship and a business relationship with Michael Rapino, the CEO, and I've learned a lot from him, and he's mentored me, and he and I sit on his board. And I think, you know, the difference between, as you talk about diversity and inclusion, is sitting on the board or putting black people on the board is one thing, but that doesn't really solve the problem. That's a that allows you to put, you know, a picture on a on a website and say your board is diverse, but the truth of the matter is you need to create and be very deliberate. And I learned this from Michael watching him uh, diversify his company as it related to women and, and now what he's going to do um, with black people. And you have to set real goals like, hey, in the next three years, we want to be held accountable. We're going to set these goals. And we're going to double our leadership with black people in the next three years. We're going to mm-hmm. we're going to literally do that. And you have to set that goal. You have to be deliberate about it, and you have to be someone has to hold the board. Is then our job is to hold the CEO accountable. Mm-hmm. Then he gets this done the same way we hold him accountable to hit his forecast, or the same way we hold him accountable um, on 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 AOI and things like that. You have to treat this the same way, and it has to be very deliberate because. The truth of the matter, David, is the system that was built to oppress black people was very deliberate, too. I mean, it's obviously, you know, there was a war, the Civil War. They went to, it was so deliberate that they went to war about keeping slavery alive. So it has to be very deliberate in the other way that, hey, we are going to hire black people this amount by this date and you have to get it done and you can and we can start to hear the 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 line about that you talked about in your article about the pipeline issue well then a you need to work harder look harder and b we need to start to build some systems and 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 things that allow you to start growing and literally manufacturing or building Mm -hmm. these people who can work in your company through the education system, going and recruiting at HBCUs right away. But then that's where the social and political change needs to happen so that you don't as a, as a, as it, so it doesn't become a class thing, right? It's, it's, it's one thing for it to be racist, but it's another thing for it to be class. As I was telling someone yesterday, you know, the protests, as they should, were very focused on black people who have been literally killed by the police. Well, there are also millions in my neighborhood, I could name you everyone I knew as a kid just about, that was my age and a black uh, boy and turned into a black man that are still alive and breathing and walking and healthy, but but basically dead, that the police, the over-policing of our neighborhood combined with the the public education system leads these people to be, you know, leads lots of black people to be uh, not with the proper education or not on the reading level by third or fourth grade, which automatically puts you on a path to end up with a criminal record, which puts you on a path that you don't go to college, you don't end up with a job, you get over-policed, and it's just a cycle that you're almost born into this and there's no pathway through it or out of it. So I think Corporate America has to be delivered, deliberate about now, fixing it and finding black executives and mentoring them, and then how do they start to help fix the system that builds a pipeline for them for many more to come? Yeah, yeah, well, well said, uh, and that echoes a lot of the sentiments that people like Melody Hobson and Darren Walker shared in that article. Melody, in particular, talking about the need to measure 
You know, she said in business, we, 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 what we care about, we measure, we put metrics behind it. And Darren in particular talking about the need uh, to go well beyond those board positions, as you said, and real give people positions of power and authority within the companies. A reminder, we're talking with Maverick Carter, CEO of Spring Hill Company, board member of Live Nation and business manager of LeBron James. You can use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask him a question. We'll get those, those in a bit. Now, Mav, you just mentioned going beyond the social and the economic to the political. And last week, you and LeBron unveiled more than a vote. You mentioned this earlier, but can you talk a bit more about what this organization is and how you aim to go beyond the traditional get out the vote initiatives and do something a bit more with this organization? Tell us just a bit about it. Yeah, David, at our company, we are a company with a mission to empower greatness in every individual, uh, both creators, writers, directors, athletes, talent, and and create brands, products, entertainment, content that also empower greatness in the consumers and the people who consume the products and the and the content that we create. So in doing that, our tagline uh, for our sports brand, Uninterrupted, was more than an athlete. So when we thought of when we came up with that uh, about two years ago, we really felt like we, we found our just do it. Um and more than an athlete became uh, bigger than just a uh, phrase, we we did products with it. We have a documentary series on ESPN Plus. But as we really start to look at it, it is truly uh, more than if you take off athlete becomes very empowering to all. And we thought, hey, why don't if we took off athlete and let people fill in their own blank more than a CEO, more than a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, more than an executive, more than a writer, more than a journalist, whatever you are more than how do you live that and become it? And as you and as we started to think about how do we have an impact as a company um, on what's going on in society, and this is, we started thinking of this, working on this probably six months ago, we landed on building a, a, a brand. It's, it's a charitable uh, side of our company, but we wanted to treat it just like it was a brand or something mm-hmm. that was, um, um, that could speak to our community to really get people out the vote, so we came up with the idea of more than a vote because, as I said, a we want to get people and, and people of color speak to them to get them out to vote because their vote matters, and every politician goes for it and tries to capture it. But it's about more than a vote because we want to come up with what's our ask and hold these politicians mm-hmm. feet mm-hmm. to the fire to make real change. So we launch, we're, 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 our official uh, launch is coming up at the end of this week on June 19th. Or we'll roll out the logo and everything, but we brought together uh, so far about 30 athletes because we felt like we know how to help athletes storytell, and athletes really have a story and really care and are very authentic voices in the communities that matter. Um, and we, we're going to launch more than a vote and build it as a as a brand and 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 really communicate to our community what we realized is in talking to the Secretary of State, specifically the Jocelyn Benson from Michigan that actually voter turnout is big and there's lots of people working on that, but also voter suppression. So we're going to have to communicate and and build messaging that really helps our community Mm -hmm. pass voter suppression. And then after that, once we get the, and and get people turned out and get people voting, then what's going to be our ass after Mm -hmm. the vote. So that's what we're Mm -hmm. focused on. And are you going to be endorsing specific candidates or is it much more focused on combating voter suppression and getting out the vote rather than uh, sort of wading into the actual uh, candidate level and, and frankly, partisan business of, of supporting one candidate or another? It's totally going to be about combating voter suppression and turning people out to vote, but we we launched it as a, it's going to be the organization is actually a 501c4 instead of c3 okay. because we want athletes to speak authentically, yeah. so we're going to help them storytell and create and, and be the brand that stands for athletes talking to their community about fighting suppression and, and getting people turned out and making sure they know that all these false narratives that are going to come out there, like if you're behind on child support, you can't vote, or if you're behind on taxes, we want to fight that. But if an athlete wants to speak authentically about what they care mm-hmm. about and what side they care about, we are never going to stop that. That's that's one thing we never do. 
Good, good. I wonder if we could go back just a bit and, and sort of take us back in time. You know, you've been on this journey, as you said, for, for 38 years in your life, but uh, you know, the last 20 in particular have really taken you on this professional journey uh, alongside LeBron for large stretches of it. And now, uh, you know, with your own interests at Live Nation and beyond. And, and listen, what you've accomplished speaks for yourself, but I, I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you got here. And a lot of people have questioned, frankly, whether you were the right person to manage LeBron's business interests along the way. And I wonder if you could take us back and share some specific instances where members of the business community, even ones who you, know, you may be working with today, perhaps, underestimated you and how you handled that because I think so many young professionals have those moments where whether it's imposter syndrome or whether they're just being genuinely second guessed by people in positions of authority they have to get over those hurdles and I wonder talk to us about how you've done that yourself yeah I think you know I definitely suffer and have went through and still deal with it imposter syndrome for sure I actually just learned what that was I think in the last three or four months I learned what imposter syndrome was and suffer from it and, and I think there was an article in the Times that I actually read that one of my mentors sent to me to read. And it's a very real thing. But I think for me, honestly, between you know, my best quality and the quality I always tell young people that you can have is be just passionately curious. I really want never stop learning and and everyone says that but but really learning about the world that you operate in and that you want to you aspire to be in and and even if you're not in that world uh now learn about it and a lot of people oftentimes want to tell you what they can add to something you're doing or an idea they have instead of just listening and learning and one of the the the, the things that I've always done is I always tell people, if you meet someone who's been successful or is very successful, the best way to learn and get information from them is to simply ask them about their successes. Now, going into that conversation, you have to know their successes, but if you really know things they've done and accomplished and you start to ask them about them and really get them going, People, it's just human nature. They love nothing more than talking about the things they've done successful. So mm. that side of me has allowed me to always learn and use that as fuel and never go into it. And, and even if I am underestimated, I'm fine with it because I go into it thinking, hey, I'm here to learn and want to get information and then figure out how to apply it to my life. And then I think also as you think about you know people saying this or saying what you can or can't do, it just adds it adds fear that we all already have, right? I'm sure you as a journalist mm-hmm. going to the Times whenever you got there, it's that's a big step to take and it's like you it's natural to have a little bit of fear or anxiety about doing it, but it's how you use that fear, right? Do you let that fear become a wall in front of you or do you use it as rocket fuel to kind of power you forward? Because fear is very powerful, right? It could it can stop you in your tracks and 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 you sit in your house and you're like I'm not going to do that I'm too nervous or you can be afraid to 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 fail and, and afraid to and and in that instance when you're afraid to fail then and and you're and you're nervous and thinking hey I can um fail then the only thing to do when you're faced with a fear or you're faced with a challenge is to get smarter. So that just always, those fears always fueled my curiosity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, well, that, that, that's good stuff and good advice. Um, I wonder if we could talk about some of the business right now and, and you and Spring Hill and LeBron have over the last several years in particular really started to strike meaningful partnerships with many of the major entertainment brands out there. And at a moment right now when celebrities and athletes have such direct relationships with their fans, I mean, LeBron has, I don't know how many social media followers across the platforms. Could you talk about why it's actually important to still strike those partnerships with the HBOs and beyond? What do they bring to the table that you all couldn't necessarily achieve on your own? Yeah, I think, you know, we have, 
partners with about every major studio and streamer um, in the world, and have, you know, sold shows all over the globe, and continue to, and will continue to. And I think for us, it's always been about you know, depending on the the project, depending on the creator, or the talent that we've brought to the table, or the idea that you have to pick your partner, the one that will best serve the idea, right? It's it's less about us or the partner and and more about the idea has to be number one and the and the creativity has to be served best, right? So we made a doc called I Promise, uh, where we filmed the first year of LeBron school and the way it laid out and the way we did it episodically Quibi happened to be the right partner, and they were a fantastic partner, and that doc was a huge success, and it's because we were able to do shorter episodes on Quibi that really made sense, and when you watch the story, telling the story in these shorter form episodes just made more sense on Quibi. Could we have made it and put it on Netflix? Sure, but it had to be in a different format, Mm -hmm. and it may not have served the creative the best, so we always start with the creators are the most important and the idea and the story that we want to tell has to be served the best. And so if you think about a show like The Shop, The Shop was best served, you know, on HBO. It really works. The Shop is a brand. HBO is a brand lineup. The mm-hmm. way, you know, if we did that show on a non-paid uh, cable network, the, the conversation, the tone of the conversation, the actual words of the conversation may have to be toned down or different. So it really works. So we always look for and serve the the idea and the and the creators and the who and the vision of our creative team or outside creators mm-hmm. that we're, what we're working with. What best serves that before we even consider what platform. Okay. Well, you mentioned Quibi and listen, the school is amazing. And anyone who isn't familiar with the story of the school needs to go check it out and and educate themselves on it. But put your media executive hat on because the school has been an enormous success out the gate. Quibi, unfortunately, not so much. What went wrong with Quibi? I I don't know if the, I mean, when you're saying what went wrong, it's almost like David, you're saying the story's over. I mean, they still got a long way to go. Um, I think um, the idea and the ambition is is awesome, and I love it. I think they um, obviously came out of the gate with heavy hitters and big time um, content uh, producers and creators. I think the one thing that I think obviously they dealt with a, a pandemic in the country, which Quibi was built for people <laughs> on the go, and unfortunately when they launched. Everyone was sitting at home, right? So no one was on the go. So they had to go back and rethink all of their plans as it related to being able to throw it to your TV through Apple Mm. TV or Chromecast or whatever, Roku, whatever you had. So they had to redo that. They had to rethink about their shows on the larger screen versus mobile. It was was built as mobile first. And then when you think about that, that like, oh, now everybody's sitting at home throwing things to their TV. So now their format, it changes how they're formatted, they're creative, because it's really meant to work for a phone that you can turn 90 degrees horizontal right. or vertical. And then once you start to think about that, it's like, well, probably if they if, if they knew what they didn't know, they probably would have started with by buying a library of some kind, because every streamer, you know, Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, they all really started with, library right instead of originals yep. and then they got netflix started with the, with buying libraries from the studios then they went to their own originals right hulu is a i think hulu has more actually more content than netflix because they have a gigantic library disney plus started with pixar and star wars so mm-hmm. i think you know if if they knew what they didn't know that everyone was going to be sitting at home they probably wouldn't have launched then a or B, they would have definitely had a library. So, but I don't think it's over. I think they got a long way to go. You know, obviously the country's starting to open back up, which I think will serve them a bit better. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, talk to us about the work at Live Nation for a minute. What do you see as your role as a director on the board of Live Nation beyond the basic fiduciary duties? Every director brings their own set of capabilities to the board table. What What is your value add beyond the just keeping uh, your eye on the balance sheet and making sure, as you said, you know, Michael is, 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 is keeping the numbers going. 
Yeah, I have obviously, as you stated, the the normal fiduciary responsibilities to the shareholders. Uh, as our job as the board is is to make sure hold management accountable that they're delivering for the shareholders ultimately, right? And um, but past that, my job simply, honestly, and Michael told me this when he when he uh, when I got nominated to be on the board is to be myself. I'm the only African American on the board, though there's women and there's diversity on the board. I'm the only African American, and I'm the youngest person on the board. So, in being myself means speaking how I speak, when I see something that I think should be changed, bring it up. If I see something that I think the company should be thinking about, bring it up. And if I if I don't understand something, I stop them and ask questions so I can better understand it. And I think, you know, I think I'm 38 years old. I grew up square in the middle of the hip-hop generation, right? Like I am a hip-hop baby, 100%. You know, every artist listened to them all, and I think hip hop gave me the audacity to, to to be able to sit in that boardroom and be comfortable that I belong as a business person, but also speak the way I speak and being who I am. And I don't, I didn't, I didn't get to that to be on that board by you know being the corporate guy wearing a suit and tie every day. To work. I've never worn a suit and tie every day to work, or play, I don't play golf or playing golf with other people on Saturdays. It's not that I don't like golf. I just don't, it's not my thing. Mm. So I got there by, you know, by my parents who helped me understand life. And then by hip hop who gave me the audacity that, Hey, listening to Jay-Z, what Puffy did, watching what cash money records did that, Hey, you can achieve things corporately, but, and still be yourself. And I think that is my job on that board, right? Is to make sure I'm bringing up things that matter to me personally that I know matter to younger people, to black people, and making sure Michael, as the CEO, which he does, and he listens to me, is pushing forward in that way, and also be helping the company, right? Because that ultimately, it's good socially, but it's also good business. Mm, Good. We've got a lot of audience questions coming in, and we'll get to them in, in just a few minutes. First of all, I want to ask about the impending, I think a lot of us fans hope, return of the NBA season. And I recognize you may not be able to comment because you're not a player on whether they should play or not, but, but please do chime in there. But as the negotiations have progressed, we, we've come to this very interesting juncture where it sounds like the, the basic frameworks of the deal are on the table, but some players seem to believe that participating in the bubble in Orlando, as it were, would compromise their ability to participate in the protests and be a part of this dialogue on race and police brutality. What's your view on the restart of the NBA season, and particularly whether participating and playing would make it harder for players to be a part of this national conversation right now? Yeah, my view is, listen, I um, I respect how everybody – feels about this and how everyone is dealing with this all the players and I get it this is not easy stuff right this is not this is not normal you know they tried to change the basketball this is really heavy stuff that that will have an effect on the world outside of basketball in a major way and have an effect on the world long term and will specifically have effect on black people right in the NBA I don't know the exact number but it's 90 something percent is is African American players or, or, or high 80s, something like that. Mm-hmm. So it's very important, and they're the they're the most influential black people we have in this country, and and and, mo- and pretty much in the world. So I totally understand all their feelings. I think you know, play or not play is not really the thing that I'm focused on. As I said earlier in this conversation, what I'm focused on is what is the ass. So we, so if you're sitting at home or you're playing, either way. What are we go- what are we going to accomplish? What do we want to change? What do we want to happen? What do we want these politicians that we want to push for? What do we want to ask them for, right? And mm-hmm. and and how do we use this moment and this momentum to get real ass, put them in play and get them done? And and playing or not playing it to me is not necessarily the debate that, or the conversation, the conversation is what do we want? And as, and as NBA players lead us that way and that, and you can, and, and they're influential playing, very influential playing and having that platform and they're influential not playing. So 
But but first we got to figure out what do we want and then figure out the tactics to get it. Okay. Let's get to some audience questions. The first one comes from Julie, and she asks a, a great question here. Julie says, people of color are overrepresented in the workforce as low-wage, frontline, or essential workers. And she said, Mav, you mentioned top-down strategies for diversity, but do you see an opportunity for a bottom-up approach for workers to gain more voice and more power? Yeah, I think the bottom-up approach is broader than just workforce. I think, you know, because black people are at the bottom of this country and in, in, in all systems, right, socioeconomically. So I think, as I said, the bottom-up as it relates to, to voting and our more than a vote, like we want to, we'll give you our vote, but what are we asking for as a bottom-up strategy for sure? And I think specifically in the workforce, the reason why I said top-down is also because in any company that I've ever had access to, and it's a lot, black people always say, which I totally get it, they get stuck at a certain level because mm -hmm. there's no one at the top to go, oh, wow, there's a young African-American woman who went to Clark just like I did, and we hang out in the same place. Let me mentor her and help her get pulled up, and then that's how you start to create pathways because that's ultimately what happens, right? It's a little bit of bias. Sometimes it's racist. And sometimes it's just pure nepotism, but the results end up the same. So who gets above middle management in a company or climbs up becomes the same from all three of those things. So I think I think the bottom-up approach, absolutely, but that has to come outside of just in the workforce. But in totality, as black people in the black community, what do we want? What are we actually asking for? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. uh, Well, well said. Um, Another listener asks, and you can imagine a lot of these questions that are coming in are, are focused on uh, making progress on some of these intractable issues of race and police brutality, given everything that's happening right now. One listener asks, how can organizations or brands take a genuine, authentic stance in support of Black Lives Matter and racial injustice when their core audience is white and majority conservative? It doesn't feel authentic. Do you have thoughts on how so many big brands have come out and expressed solidarity for the protesters and for this movement when, and again, I pointed this out in my article, many of these same companies have anything but admirable track records on these very issues? Yeah, I, you know what, David, the truth is, and to the, uh, the person who asked the question, I mean, this is America. There's not going to be many companies or institutions long you know these institute these companies that are essentially institutions that have a good track record with black people mm -hmm. is just this the country has a horrible reputation you know track record yeah. with black people so you're not going to find many institutions some are trying it now some have better than others you know if you rank them against each other some have better than others but as i said earlier the only way to fix this both with the, in the, within the country and in the socially and economically within businesses is to we have to have a real ask and be deliberate and, and, and hold people accountable, the CEOs of these companies, the people who run these companies, the politicians. We have to have a real ask. And obviously one of the main ones is police brutality, right? Like that's a big social issue that we have in over-policing in the black community, but it can't stop there because that's not going to fix our, all of our problems. That's that the over policing and the police brutality is the beginning of the, uh, I, I should say is towards the beginning of the, of the system failing us, but education, you know, kids who, who don't from, go from third grade to fourth grade, not on the par with the reading level by the time they get to fourth grade, that's what the private prison industry uses to forecast how many more prisons they will need based on the inventory they think they will be getting, just like any other business. Yeah. So the education system starts to fail you there. Then you're over police. Like it's, it's, it's. We have to have very specific ask, and 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 it has to go past just getting the over policing. It has to be in in a, in a multitude of ways. But but I think the only way to get the country and these institutions, we have to have something deliberate that we want. Hey. Such and such company, you have 
you have 15 people in your C-suite. Not one of them are black. In a year and a half, you need to have at least three black people in your C-suite. We need to do things like that that are very deliberate. Yeah. And we've seen some states take steps in this direction with other uh, minority groups in the business community, at least, when uh, I'm thinking, of course, of California's law that required gender diversity, at least on public company boards. So there is a... Yeah, uh, the, there's a precedent. There's, there. There, are. there, there are. There's a precedent, and this and it works, by the way. At, 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 at Live Nation, they had 30 presidents in the company. Uh, two years ago, Michael said, at the end of this year, we need to have 10 female presidents. Guess what? At the end of the year, you know how many female presidents they had? 10. And there if we go. have to add some, if we have to add more presidents, whatever we have to do, we have to get to 10, and it's very deliberate. So there there are, and he got it done and did it. And, and that's when I learned that that you can do that, and it works, and it's the right thing to do. Yeah. We've got questions about the business as well. Catherine asks, how will the content that Spring Hill creates differentiate the company from others that create TV content? How are you making choices about what to produce? Well, first off, how I differentiate is we are very focused and the thread that we pull through all of our content, our live events, our products, you know, we have the, the vision to be, you know, a bit of like um, uh, the, the most culturally connected entertainment company in the world in the same way that Disney wants to you know, promote fun and everybody have fun. We want to be connected to culture and really inspired by um, our community and our people. And, and, and really the big difference is we have a mission in our company and at our company, we build brands, entertainment, content products that serve our mission and not the opposite way around. Meaning we do not, um, we didn't build a product and then write a mission that, that serves the product we actually build things that serve our mission and serve our community and and the truth is that thread of empowerment we pull it through every angle not just the content we're making but who makes it so for instance we made a tv show called self-made that debuted on netflix on march 20th uh and the show um did very well was number one in the u.s on netflix for the first five days it was up starring octavia spencer uh, one of the great actors in the world, and the show, the content was about uh, Madam C.J. Walker, who's the first self-made African-American millionaire in this country, and the first self-made female millionaire, regardless of race, in this country, going back to the early 1900s. So if you think about that content, it's already empowering. Then if you think about Octavia playing the role, and she spoke about working with us, and how we really empowered her, just on her deal, and her deal-making with Netflix, and then we had a, a African American woman showrunner was an African American woman, the director and the writer. So that's what we do to really differentiate. We really pull that thread of empowerment through what we make, who stars in it, and who creates it with us, and how it's marketed. Mm. Well, you just asked and uh, answered essentially uh, the question that another listener was going to ask, but I want to give you the opportunity to. To, to answer it with a focus really on your employees. And, and the question that a listener asked was, you spoke about your company empowering athletes, talent, creatives, et cetera. But as the company, how are you empowering those who work for you? So instead of looking around at the peer level, look down, down that org chart. What are you doing to develop the next That's generation of leaders inside the company? That's a great question. And I should have said that our focus on empowerment starts with our own team uh, from the beginning, we have just over a hundred employees and, and all of us that work for the company, the, the feeling of empowerment starts at home with all of us and the feeling that the, the, you know, our goal as a business is to be very efficient and, and we have shareholders, we have to drive shareholder value and build an amazing company. But, but the ultimate goal is quality right so how do we that is the goal for us to create the the best quality in everything that we do so in doing that everyone needs to be involved in fixing problems right so so the way we empower is we talk about quality control on our content on our products our events our creative ideas quality control is everyone's job and at any point like like if you're an assembly line worker and you're working on an assembly line at a, at a at a car company, a car manufacturer. At certain points of the line, there's a there's a string that someone can pull to stop the line, 
and only certain people can pull it. Well, our 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 motto is anyone can pull it. Everyone has a a line that they can pull and stop the assembly line and go, hey, this isn't right, or fix this and voice their opinion. Doesn't mean you'll get agreements. Doesn't mean you won't get you won't get criticism back. But 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 we look at feedback as additive and not competitive. So we try and use feedback to really spark discussions because we're a creative-led company. So we need um, those those discussions, and I think our job as as and then our job as management in the company is to not mitigate or stop people from giving feedback or giving criticism or even stop people from taking risk. Our job as management is to build an organization that we can rebound from a problem or an issue or or we took a risk and it didn't work out. How do we rebound from it? That's our job as management. And that starts with empowering everybody to feel like quality control is everyone's job. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. Um, I'd like to see more organizations take that approach. Um, listen, this is probably the first one of these calls we've done where we haven't spent a fair amount of time talking about the virus. And it's a serious issue, especially for the African-American community. And I wonder when you think about the last four months or so, how has this coronavirus pandemic affected you personally, your community, and also the business, of course. So much production has been stopped. I suspect many of your team has been working from home. Just give us a rundown on how the last four months has gone for you personally and also at the company. Yeah, I think business-wise, it's um, like every other business, we're down, you know, we're way down, you know, and, and, and we're, you know, we're a company that produces content and, and does live events, so we had to freeze all of that. So we're way down. Um, honestly, the numbers are way down, but the morale is up. Um, we've been able to, you know, in the middle of this, we were we were in the middle of making, you know, uh, really uh, bring our company together so we we really have got to spend time with each other from management to everyone else you know it's ironic because the the business was down and we had to stop a bunch of things but it made it it, it forced everyone to get to know each other better right just simple things i keep i was telling everyone like now you're on these zoom calls and we're all doing them from home so now all of my coworkers and people I work with, I'm getting to meet their kids and their dog and seeing their house that I otherwise probably never would have went to some of my coworkers' house or got to see their dog or how they live. Like, it just felt, even though you're on this screen, right, and you're not with each other, felt more intimate. Now, we are, we're a creative company, so we do have to get back to the office, and there's nothing to replace that 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 uh, that brainstorming that happens uh, without a meeting, right? Just bumping into someone in the hall of our office and just started brainstorming and coming up with ideas. We're missing that, and we need that. And we need that human interaction. But, but part of it is getting to know each other a bit better. Um, really, helped. I think personally for me, it, it was a, it's been a challenge. You know, my family. We we live you know in an apartment building, so we went moved and, and came back. But I've adjusted. I'm ready to get back into the office at some point and work and see my team and, and get back with coworkers. And I think as as black people, this is the ultimate version of the, the, the saying that when America catches a cold, black people get the flu. I mean, it's just, it's just hard. Everything is harder on us, right? The unemployment numbers and the rehiring numbers, mm-hmm. if you look at them are just worse for black people. Cause as I said earlier, and, and to someone's question, the bottom down approach, we're kind of, we've been at the bottom since we got here and, and, and fighting and striving to change things. Okay. You've talked a lot on this call about asks, asks of corporations, asks of our political leaders. And I give you the the last question uh, as an invitation to make an ask of all of us. What do you want the people on this call and the people reading this article to do? What's your ask for the audience of the New York Times at this moment right now? That's a great question, David. What I would ask is that if – to people who are not black to really listen at this time. And, and if you really listen and, and really understand and, and instead of, you know, we're all human beings, but just be human and really listen as a human, you'll understand the frustration, the hurt 
and and you'll have empathy and understand it. And then once the black community comes with the proper ass to support them and 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 the things that you know are wrong, be deliberate about changing them the same way that everyone uh, is deliberate about doing something right for themselves. Be deliberate about changing things for black people because it's just it's just socially good to do it. But it's also if you're in business or for the country, diversity is 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 good for business. It's good for the country. It's the right thing to do because whether you're the most greedy person in the world and you want to keep everything yourself, well, if other people have nothing, then they're coming to take yours. Or if you're the person who wants everybody to have it, to have the fair shot, we we all should want the same thing, right? So I think we have to be very deliberate about making this change but it's got to be a lot of listening first black people have to make their ask and then the people who support and understand it have to push with us okay thank you matt thank you david i appreciate it and thank you all for joining us on today's call to find out more about our full slate of digital events including the next installment of corner office live please visit timesevents.nytimes.com Next week on June 23rd, at this same time, I'll be joined by the CEO of Feeding America, Claire Babineau Fontenot, to talk about the hunger crisis, charitable giving, and nonprofits in the age of the coronavirus. And please, subscribe to the New York Times. It's the support of listeners and readers like you that make our reporting possible. We'll look forward to speaking with you again, and thank you. Have a good day.